Chapter Three, Part One of Winds of Doctrine: Studies in Contemporary Opinion by George Santayana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Three: The Philosophy of Monsieur Henri Bergson. Chapter Three: The Philosophy of Monsieur Henri Bergson. Part One the most representative and remarkable of living philosophers is henri bergson both the form and the substance of his works attract universal attention his ideas are pleasing and bold and at least in form wonderfully original he is persuasive without argument and mystical without conventionality he moves in the atmosphere of science and free thought yet seems to transcend them and to be secretly religious an undercurrent of zeal and even of prophecy seems to animate his subtle analyses and his surprising fancies he is eloquent and to a public rather sick of the half education it has received and eager for some inspiriting novelty he seems more eloquent than he is he uses the french language and little else is french about him in the manner of the more recent artists and words retaining the precision of phrase and the measured judgments which are traditional in french literature yet managing to envelop everything in a penumbra of emotional suggestion each expression of an idea is complete in itself yet these expressions are often varied and constantly metaphorical so that we are led to feel that much in that idea has remained unexpressed and is indeed inexpressible studied and insinuating as m bergson is in his style he is no less elaborate in his learning in the history of philosophy in mathematics and physics and especially in natural history he has taken great pains to survey the ground and to assimilate the views and spirit of the most recent scholars he might be called outright an expert in all these subjects were it not for a certain externality and want of radical sympathy in his way of conceiving them a genuine historian of philosophy for instance would love to rehearse the views of great thinkers would feel their eternal plausibility and in interpreting them would think of himself as little as they ever thought of him but m bergson evidently regards plato or kant as persons who did or did not prepare the way for some bergsonian insight the theory of evolution taken enthusiastically is apt to exercise an evil influence on the moral estimation of things first the evolutionist asserts that later things grew out of earlier which is true of things in their causes and basis but not in their values as modern greece proceeds out of ancient greece materially but does not exactly crown it the evolutionist however proceeds to assume that later things are necessarily better than what they have grown out of and this is false altogether this fallacy reinforces very unfortunately that inevitable esteem which people have for their own opinions and which must always vitiate the history of philosophy when it is a philosopher that writes it a false subordination comes to be established among systems as if they moved in single file and all had the last the author's system for their secret goal in hegel for instance this conceit is conspicuous in spite of his mastery in the dramatic presentation of points of view for his way of reconstructing history was on the surface very sympathetic he too like m bergson proceeded from learning to intuition and feigned at every turn to identify himself with what he was describing especially if this was a philosophical attitude or temper yet in reality his historical judgments were forced and brutal greece was but a stepping-stone to prussia plato and spinoza found their highest synthesis in himself and though he may not say so frankly jesus christ and saint francis realized their better selves in luther actual spiritual life the thoughts affections and pleasures of individuals passed with hegel for so much moonshine the true spirit was objective it was simply the movement of those circumstances in which actual spirit arose he was accordingly contemptuous of everything intrinsically good and his idealism consisted in forcing the natural world into a formula of evolution and then worshipping it as the embodiment of the living god 
but under the guise of optimism and belief in a cosmic reason this is a mere idolatry of success a malign superstition by which all moral independence is crushed out and conscience enslaved to chronology and it is no marvel if somewhat to relieve this subjection history in turn was expurgated marshalled and distorted that it might pass muster for the work of the holy ghost in truth the value of spiritual life is intrinsic and centred at every point it is never wholly recoverable to recover it at all an historian must have a certain detachment and ingenuousness knowing the dignity and simplicity of his own mind he must courteously attribute the same dignity and simplicity to others unless their avowed attitude prevents this is to be an intelligent critic and to write history like a gentleman the truth which all philosophers alike are seeking is eternal it lies as near to one age as to another the means of discovery alone change and not always for the better the course of evolution is no test of what is true or good else nothing could be good intrinsically nor true simply and ultimately on the contrary it is the approach to truth and excellent anywhere like the approach of tree-tops to the sky that tests the value of evolution and determines whether it is moving upward or downward or in a circle m bergson accordingly misses fire when for instance in order utterly to damn a view which he has been criticising and which may be open to objection on other grounds he cries that those who hold it retardant sur kant as if a clock were the compass of the mind and he who was one minute late was one point off the course kant was a hard honest thinker more sinned against than sinning from whom a great many people in the nineteenth century have taken their point of departure departing as far as they chose but if a straight line of progress could be traced at all through the labyrinth of philosophy kant would not lie in that line his thought is essentially eccentric and sophisticated being largely based on two inherited blunders which a truly progressive philosophy would have to begin by avoiding thus leaving kant on one side and weathering his philosophy as one might scylla or charybdis the one blunder was that of the english malicious psychology which had maintained since the time of locke that the ideas in the mind are the only objects of knowledge instead of being the knowledge of objects the other blunder was that of protestantism that in groping after that moral freedom which is so ineradicable a need of a pure spirit thought to find it in a revision of revelation tradition and prejudice so as to be able to cling to these a little longer how should a system so local so accidental and so unstable as kant's be prescribed as a sort of catechism for all humanity the tree of knowledge has many branches and all its fruits are not condemned to hang forever from that one gnarled and contorted bough m bergson himself lags behind kant on those points on which his better insight requires it as for instance on the reality of time but with regard to his own philosophy i am afraid he thinks that all previous systems empty into it which is hardly true and that all future systems must flow out of it which is hardly necessary the embarrassment that qualifies m bergson's attainments in mathematics and physics has another and more personal source he understands but he trembles non-human immensities frighten him as they did pascal he suffers from cosmic agoraphobia we might think empty space an innocent harmless thing a mere opportunity to move which ought to be highly prized by all devotees of motion but m bergson is instinctively a mystic and his philosophy deliberately discredits the existence of anything except in immediacy that is as an experience of the heart what he dreads in space is that the heart should be possessed by it and transformed into it he dreads that the imagination should be fascinated by the homogeneous and static hypnotized by geometry and actually lost in aus einandersein this would be a real death and petrifaction of consciousness frozen into contemplation of a monotonous infinite void 
what is warm and desirable is rather the sense of variety and succession as if all visions radiated from the occupied focus or hearth of the self the more concentration at this habitable point with the more mental perspectives opening backwards and forwards through time in a word the more personal and historical the apparition the better it would be things must be reduced again to what they seem it is vain and terrible to take them for what we find they are an apologist for very old human prejudices an apologist for animal illusion his whole labour is a plea for some vague but comfortable faith which he dreads to have stolen from him by the progress of art and knowledge there is a certain trepidation a certain suppressed instinct to snap at and sting the hated oppressor as if some desperate small being were at bay before a horrible monster m bergson is afraid of space of mathematics of necessity and of eternity he is afraid of the intellect and the possible discoveries of science he is afraid of nothingness and death these fears may prevent him from being a philosopher in the old and noble sense of the word but they sharpen his sense for many a psychological problem and make him the spokesman of many an inarticulate soul animal timidity and animal illusion are deep in the heart of all of us practice may compel us to bow to the conventions of the intellect as to those of polite society but secretly in our moments of immersion in ourselves we may find them a great nuisance even a vain nightmare could we only listen undisturbed to the beat of protoplasm in our hearts would not that oracle solve all the riddles of the universe or at least avoid them to protect this inner conviction however it is necessary for the mystic to sally forth and attack the enemy on his own ground if he refuted physics and mathematics simply out of his own faith he might be accused of ignorance of the subject he will therefore study it conscientiously yet with a certain irritation and haste to be done with it somewhat as a jesuit might study protestant theology such a student however is apt to lose his pains for in retracing a free inquiry in his servile spirit he remains deeply ignorant not indeed of its form but of its nature and value why for instance has m bergson such a horror of mechanical physics he seems to think it a black art dealing in unholy abstractions and rather dangerous to salvation and he keeps his metaphysical exorcisms and antidotes always at hand to render it innocuous at least to his own soul but physical science never solicited of anybody that he should be wholly absorbed in the contemplation of atoms and worship them that we must worship and lose ourselves in reality whatever reality may be is a mystic aberration which physical science does nothing to foster nor does any critical physicist suppose that what he describes is the whole of the object he merely notes the occasions on which its sensible qualities appear and calculates events because the calculable side of nature is his province he does not deny that events have other aspects the psychic and the moral for instance no less real in their way in terms of which calculation would indeed be impossible if he chances to call the calculable elements of nature her substance as it is proper to do that name is given without passion he may perfectly well proclaim with goethe that it is in the accidents in the farbiger abglanz that we have our life and if it be for his freedom that the mystic trembles i imagine any man of science would be content with m bergson's assertion that true freedom is the sense of freedom and that in any intelligible statement of the situation even the most indeterministic this freedom disappears for it is an immediate experience not any scheme of relation between events the horror of mechanical physics arises then from attributing to that science pretensions and extensions which it does not have it arises from the habits of theology and metaphysics being imported inopportunely into science similarly when m bergson mentions mathematics he seems to be thinking of the supposed authority it exercises one of kant's confusions over the empirical world and trying to limit and subordinate that authority lest movement should somehow be removed from nature lest movement should somehow be removed from nature and vagueness from human thought 
but nature and human thought are what they are they have enough affinity to mathematics as it happens to suggest that study to our minds and to give those who go deep into it a great though partial mastery over things nevertheless a true mathematician is satisfied with the hypothetical and ideal cogency of his science and puts its dignity in that moreover m bergson has the too pragmatic notion that the use of mathematics is to keep our accounts straight in this business world whereas its inherent use is emancipating and platonic in that it shows us the possibility of other worlds less contingent and perturbed than this one if he allows himself any excursus from his beloved immediacy it is only in the interests of practice he little knows the pleasures of a liberal mind ranging over the congenial realm of internal accuracy and ideal truth where it can possess itself of what treasures it likes in perfect security and freedom an artist in his workmanship m bergson is not an artist in his allegiance he has no respect for what is merely ideal for this very reason perhaps he is more at home in natural history than in the exact sciences he has the gift of observation and can suggest vividly the actual appearance of natural processes in contrast to the verbal paraphrase of these processes which is sometimes taken to explain them he is content to stop at habit without formulating laws he refuses to assume that the large obvious cycles of change in things can be reduced to mechanism that is to minute included cycles repeated ad libitum he may sometimes defend this refusal by sophistical arguments as when he says that mechanism would require the last stage of the universe to be simultaneous with the first forgetting that the unit of mechanism is not a mathematical equation but some observed typical event the refusal itself however would be honest scepticism enough were it made with no arrière pensée but simply in view of the immense complexity of the facts and the extreme simplicity of the mechanical hypothesis in such a situation to halt at appearances might seem the mark of a true naturalist and a true empiricist not misled by speculative haste and the human passion for system and simplification at the first reading m bergson's creative evolution may well dazzle the professional naturalist and seem to him an illuminating confession of the nature and limits of his science yet a second reading i have good authority for saying may as easily reverse that impression m bergson never reviews his facts in order to understand them but only if possible to discredit others who may have fancied they understood he raises difficulties he marks the problems that confront the naturalist and the inadequacy of explanations that may have been suggested such criticism would be a valuable beginning if it were followed by the suggestion of some new solution but the suggestion only is that no solution is possible that the phenomena of life are simply miraculous and that it is in the tendency or vocation of the animal not in its body or its past that we must see the ground of what goes on before us with such a philosophy of science it is evident that all progress in the understanding of nature would cease as it ceased after aristotle the attempt would again be abandoned to reduce gross and obvious cycles of change such as generation growth and death to minute latent cycles so that natural history should offer a picturesque approach to universal physics if for the magic power of types invoked by aristotle we substituted with m bergson the magic power of the elan vital that is of evolution in general we should be referring events not to finer more familiar more pervasive processes but to one all-embracing process unique and always incomplete our understanding would end in something far vaguer and looser than what our observation began with aristotle at least could refer particulars to the specific types as medicine and social science are still glad enough to do to help them in guessing and in making a learned show before the public but if divination and eloquence for science is out of the question were to invoke nothing but a fluid tendency to grow we should be left with a flat history of phenomena and no means of prediction or even classification all knowledge would be reduced to gossip infinitely diffuse perhaps enlisting our dramatic feelings 
but yielding no intellectual mastery of experience no practical competence and no moral lesson the world would be a serial novel to be continued forever and all men mere novel readers nothing is more familiar to philosophers nowadays than that criticism of knowledge by which we are thrown back upon the appearances from which science starts upon what is known to children and savages whilst all that which long experience and reason may infer from those appearances is set down as so much hypothesis and indeed it is through hypothesis that latent being if such there be comes before the mind at all now such criticism of knowledge might have been straightforward and ingenuous it might have simply disclosed the fact very salutary to meditate upon that the whole frame of nature with the minds that animate it is disclosed to us by intelligence that if we were not intelligent our sensations would exist for us without meaning anything as they exist for idiots the criticism of knowledge however has usually been taken maliciously in the sense that it is the idiots only that are not deceived for any interpretation of sensation is a mental figment and while experience may have any extent it will it cannot possibly they say have expressive value it cannot reveal anything going on beneath intelligence and science are accordingly declared to have no penetration no power to disclose what is latent for nothing latent exists they can at best furnish symbols for past or future sensations and the order in which they arise they can be seven league boots for striding over the surface of sentient this negative dogmatism as to knowledge was rendered harmless and futile by the english philosophers in that they maintained at the same time that everything happens exactly as if the intellect were a true instrument of discovery and as if a material world underlay our experience and furnished all its occasions hume mill and huxley were scientific at heart and full of the intelligence they dissected they seemed to cry to nature though thou dost not exist yet will i trust in thee their idealism was a theoretical scruple rather than a passionate superstition he is not so simple as to invoke the malicious criticism of knowledge in order to go on thinking rationalistically reason and science make him deeply uncomfortable his point accordingly is not merely that mechanism is a hypothesis but that it is a wrong hypothesis events do not come as if mechanism brought them about they come at least in the organic world as if a magic destiny and inscrutable ungovernable effort were driving them on thus m bergson introduces metaphysics into natural history he invokes in what is supposed to be science the agency of a power called the elan vital on a level with the will of schopenhauer or the unknowable force of herbert spencer but there is a scientific vitalism also which it is well to distinguish from the metaphysical sort the point at issue between vitalism and mechanism in biology is whether the living processes in nature can be resolved into a combination of the material the material processes will always remain vital if we take this word in a descriptive and poetic sense for they will contain a movement having a certain idiosyncrasy and taking a certain time like the fall of an apple the movement of nature is never dialectical the first part of any event does not logically imply the last part of it physics is descriptive historical reporting after the fact what are found to be the habits of matter but if these habits are constant and calculable we call the vitality of them mechanical thus the larger processes of nature no matter how vital they may be and whatever consciousness may accompany them will always be mechanical if they can be calculated and predicted being a combination of the more minute and widespread processes which they contain the only question therefore is do processes such as nutrition and reproduction arise by a combination of such events as the fall of apples or are they irreducible events and units of mechanism by themselves that is the dilemma as it appears in science both possibilities will always remain open because however far mechanical analysis may go many phenomena as human apprehension presents them will always remain irreducible to any common denominator with the rest and on the other hand wherever the actual reduction of the habits of animals to those of matter may have stopped we can never know that a further reduction is impossible 
the balance of reasonable presumption however is not even the most inclusive movements known to us in nature the astronomical are calculable and so are the most minute and pervasive processes the chemical these are also if evolution is to be accepted the earliest processes upon which all others have supervened and out of which as it were they have grown apart from miraculous intervention therefore the assumption seems to be inevitable that the intermediate processes are calculable too and compounded out of the others the appearance to the contrary presented in animal and social life is easily explicable on psychological grounds we read inevitably in terms of our passions those things which affect them or are analogous to what involves passion in ourselves and when the mechanism of them is hidden from us as is that of our bodies we suppose that these passions which we find on the surface in ourselves or read into other creatures are the substantial and only forces that carry on our part of the world penetrating this illusion dispassionate observers in all ages have received the general impression that nature is one and mechanical this was and still remains a general impression only but i suspect no one who walks the earth with his eyes open would be concerned to resist it were it not for certain fond human conceits which such a view would rebuke and if accepted would tend to obliterate the psychological illusion that our ideas and purposes are original facts and forces instead of expressions in consciousness of facts and forces which are material and the practical and optical illusion that everything wheels about us in this world these are the primitive persuasions which the enemies of naturalism have always been concerned to protect one might indeed be a vitalist in biology out of pure caution and conscientiousness without sharing those prejudices and many a speculative philosopher has been free from them who has been a vitalist in metaphysics schopenhauer for instance observed that the cannon-ball which if self-conscious would think it moved freely would be quite right in thinking so the will was as evident to him in mechanism as in animal life m bergson in the more hidden reaches of his thought seems to be a universal vitalist apparently an elan vital must have existed once to deposit in inorganic matter the energy stored there and to set mechanism going but he relies on biology alone to prove the present existence of an independent effort to live this is needed to do what mechanism as he thinks could never do it is not needed to do as in schopenhauer what mechanism does m bergson thus introduces his metaphysical force as a peculiar requirement of biology he breaks the continuity of nature he asks the poetic justification of a new metaphysical vitalism he asks us to believe that life is not a natural expression of material being but an alien and ghostly madness descending into it i say a ghostly madness for why should disembodied life wish that the body should live this vitalism is not a kind of biology more prudent and literal than the mechanical kind as a scientific vitalism would be but far less legitimately speculative nor is it a frank and thorough mythology such as the total spectacle of the universe might suggest to an imaginative genius it is rather a popular animism insisting on a sympathetic interpretation of nature where human sympathy is quick and easy and turning this sympathy into a revelation of the absolute but leaving the rest of nature cold because to sympathize with its movement there is harder for anxious self-centred mortals and requires a disinterested mind m bergson would have us believe that mankind is what nature has set her heart on and the best she can do for whose sake she has been long making very special efforts we are fortunate that at least her darling is all mankind and not merely israel in spite then of m bergson's learning as a naturalist and his eye for the facts things aristotle also possessed he is like aristotle profoundly out of sympathy with nature aristotle was alienated from nature and any penetrating study of it by the fact that he was a disciple of socrates and therefore essentially a moralist and a logician m bergson is alienated from nature by something quite different he is the adept of a very modern very subtle and very arbitrary art that of literary psychology in this art the imagination is invited to conceive things as if they were all centres of passion and sensation
literary psychology is not a science it is practised by novelists and poets yet if it was to be brilliantly executed it demands a minute and extended observation of life unless your psychological novelist had crammed his memory with pictures of the ways and aspects of men he would have no starting point for his psychological fictions he would not be able to render them circumstantial and convincing just so m bergson's achievements in psychological fiction to be so brilliantly executed as they are required all his learning the history of philosophy mathematics and physics and above all natural history had to supply him first with suggestions and if he is not really a master in any of those fields that is not to be wondered at his heart is elsewhere to write a universal biological romance such as he has sketched for us in his system he would ideally have required all scientific knowledge but only as homer required the knowledge of seamanship generalship statecraft augury and charioteering in order to turn the aspects of them into poetry and not with that technical solidity which plato unjustly blames him for not possessing just so m bergson's proper achievement begins where his science ends and his philosophy lies entirely beyond the horizon of possible discoveries or empirical probabilities in essence it is myth or fable but in the texture and degree of its fabulousness it differs notably from the performances of previous metaphysicians primitive poets even ancient philosophers were not psychologists their fables were compacted out of elements found in practical life and they reckoned in the units in which language and passion reckon wooing feasting fighting vice virtue happiness justice above all they talked about persons or about ideals this man this woman this typical thought or sentiment was what fixed their attention and seemed to them the ultimate thing not so m bergson he is a microscopic psychologist and even in man what he studies by preference is not some integrated passion or idea but something far more recondite the minute texture of sensation memory or impulse sharp analysis is required to distinguish or arrest these elements yet these are the predestined elements of his fable and so his anthropomorphism is far less obvious than that of most poets and theologians though no less real end of chapter three part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine